September uh, State Technical Committee meeting. We appreciate your attending here in person. And then also thank you to those of you who are online. And uh, we appreciate your joining us today. So um, as today is September 11th, I would like to first uh, uh, open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And then we'll take a moment of silence for today. So if you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Now at this time, we'll just take a moment of silence for um, National Patriot Day and today is the National Day of Service and Remembrance. And please join me in the silence as we um, honor those who served and respect those who have uh, given the ultimate sacrifice and those are who are in service today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So today, um, just a couple reminders for the meeting is that um, the the announcements for the State Technical Committee are distributed via our farmers.gov. And there's a listserv in there called Gov Delivery. And with that, you can go to Gov Delivery, or excuse me, you can go to farmers.gov and you can scroll down and find the subscribe button. And in that subscribe button, there will be many options for topics to select from, from USDA. And specifically, you'll want to select the one that says State Technical Committee and also probably the one that says News Releases. And what's really cool about the Farmers.gov uh, listserv is that you can actually go all the way down to uh, county-specific zip codes and, and uh, choose announcements for specific counties as well. So that's, that's what we have available. We also have a mailing list. So we're, we're integrated, right? In the old days, we had a mailing list with the US Postal Service. Nowadays, we have electronics. So we're still doing a hybrid meeting and, and hybrid uh, notifications. So uh, on my staff is Randy Papka, and she is the secretary responsible for uh, communications with the State Technical Committee. So she can be contacted as well as I can to be um, to be put on the mailing list if you prefer to have a paper copy uh, or, or if something's wrong with email and, and the, no, the notifications are coming through. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna pass this to uh, Tony Sinclair, our state conservationist. Thank you, Colette. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Sinclair, I'm the state conservationist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service here in South Dakota. Uh, we have had a tremendous year. And it's not just because of what NRCS is able to do on its own, but it's because of how much work we have. We've been able to obligate near $90 million across all of our programs. And that's with our CSP program. That's with our, I'm going to try to, I don't know how everybody is completely familiar with the program. So CSP is our conservation stewardship program. It's, it's one of the programs that we utilize to work with producers that are already doing great things across the landscape and we're encouraging them to do more enhancements. So about $40 million went into CSP this year across the state. For our EQIP program, our environmental quality incentives program, roughly uh, $40, $45 million went into that program. And again, this is across the state. We have a lot of applications, and this is more funding than South Dakota has ever dealt with before. Last year, I want to say we were probably closer, and Val's going to correct me, but she comes up later on all these different numbers. But we've seen significant increase with the Inflation Reduction Act. Last year, we were probably closer to $40 million total. This year, we jumped up to closer to $80 million. And this is just year number two of this IRA funding, this ramp up with funding for the agency. As we move into fiscal year 25, we're right on the edge of we're expecting to start off with probably about $100 million in the Shaw allocation. This is, this is huge. This is bigger than we have ever seen in South Dakota. But one of the benefits of being able to see this investment come to South Dakota is the money's being spent here. The money is being delivered here to South Dakota for South Dakota's use and the investments that are being made here in the state. Or, and and I'm, I'm just talking about our, our CSP program. I'm talking about our EQIP program. Another program that we're working on ramping up here in the state 
is our ASIP program, our Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. We have, there's a lot of funding that's been authorized going into fiscal year 25. We're looking at, I think, $500 million nationwide that's going to be invested in this program. It's a big program. And right now, the way that South Dakota has mostly used ASAP has been under our reserve easement program. And that's going to be going out there looking at marginal, marginal wetlands and trying to protect those. Wetlands for South Dakota are important. They're, they're huge for our wildlife populations, and it's something that is important to South Dakota's way of life. A program that we really haven't tapped into very much is the Agricultural Land Easement Program. Program that, again, we're going to have a significant investment. We're going to have a lot more flexibility as we move forward into 25 to kind of move money around between WRE and ALE. So hopefully we'll be able to get down the list a little further on some more of our ALE applications. But just to give you an idea as far as on the WRE side for easements for South Dakota, we have about 1,300 easements across the state for our wetland reserve easement. We're the second, I think we're the second highest number of easements in the nation. That's huge. It's huge for a state like South Dakota. For our staffing across the state, we have moved up just from just from two years ago. We were sitting at roughly 290 staff statewide. And because of this increase in workload, this increase in funding that we've seen, we've had to increase staff to try to figure out how to deal with that and making sure that we're delivering these services and this technical assistance to producers across the state. We have, a, we have a plan to try to get to about 340 staff. So that's gaining 50 staff across the state. We're close. We're already up to 320. So we gained 30, and that may not seem like a lot over the course of two years. But if we're dealing, we're dealing with folks moving out of state, we're dealing with retirements, we're dealing with people going to other agencies, uh, promotions, internal hiring. It's a challenge to move up, and we've gained 30 staff. And this is staff across the state. We're the, the big issue that we're running into right now is that some of our field offices are running out of space. So we're seeing significant increases and we're finding ways to continue to improve our services across the state. But again, we can't do that without the assistance of our partners from across the state. Uh, we, we've, we're spending between five to $10 million a year uh, investing in partner agreements and trying to find ways to supplement our staff with additional staff from different entities to to help make sure that we're getting these conservation programs out across the state and what i what i'm telling my staff as we continue to go in this direction is we're, we're actually getting it done with the help of partners with this new staff we're actually getting more conservation on the ground and i just i want to start off this meeting today with, with just appreciation of so much support from so many of our partners that have helped get this done and helped deliver this message across the state so as i have already mentioned ira has been a significant priority and will continue to be a significant priority over the next couple of years it was supposed to be a four-year ramp up again we're in year number two moving into year number three year number four will be the last year of this this increase ira related funding so now we're we're in a position where we're, we're waiting. We're trying to see what does this next farm bill look like for the agency? How is that going to impact us moving forward? Because that's going to really dictate what does this look like for 26, 27, 28. And we're trying to make sure that we're planning out that part of it to just ensure that we're continuing to deliver this conservation mission to our partners across the state and to our, to our entities. Uh, South Dakota has been focusing on a strategic plan. We set up a strategic plan last year. Uh, and we went out and listened to our partners and we listened to our staff trying to figure out how are we going to continue moving this agency forward with this increase in funding and this this expectation that we've been given by by the president and by Congress to make sure that we're moving this so forward. Uh, a lot of the items within our strategic plan were really focused internally at NRCS. We have a lot of new staff over the last five years. And I mentioned we only moved up like 30 staff as far as our overall numbers go, but that's 150 new staff that we have now over the last five years in South Dakota. Roughly half of my staff is new. It's huge. Huge. When we have staff 320, 150 of them being new. We've had to make a significant investment in trying to train those staff. Because we have all these new people on board, they don't know everything. And we can't expect them to know everything they never want on the job. So our existing experienced staff have had to put a lot of investment in trying to train those new staff while dealing with more money than they've ever seen before. And they've been doing a phenomenal job across the state. I want to make sure I'm giving kudos to the field staff because they have been doing a great job making sure that we're getting our programs out the door and not just getting programs out the door, but making sure that 
our, our farmers are getting technical assistance because it's more than just money. It's also about that technical assistance component, making sure that the farmers are, are understanding why they're doing these things that we're encouraging them to do and making that connection. And our staff are doing a really good job on it. We still have a ways to go as we work on getting that experience up, but they're, they're getting there. And as we continue down the road, it's just going to get better. We're also looking at a couple of key positions. I, I mentioned a few state techs ago that we were looking at hiring a state economist. We have a state economist on board. We're looking at hiring a uh, state salinity soil scientist. Uh, we're looking at building some of these positions, building additional positions to make sure that we're, we're meeting the needs of South Dakota. Another addition that we've made, and, and Colette's going to have an opportunity to talk about this a little bit more too, is we're making investments right now in our, in our partnerships team. Uh, we have hired a couple new folks onto our public affairs team. It's going to be helping us with getting success stories out the door and then talking about this conservation that we're actually getting on the ground across the state. Because doing it is one thing, doing it's important, but communicating what we're actually accomplishing is something that's just as important. We need to make sure that, that folks across the state understand why we do this. Why are we doing this work? So we're going to be focusing on trying to get this message out the door and making sure that more and more farmers and producers across the state understand the importance of conservation. So one last thing before we dive into our meeting is I, I like to start these meetings off with why do we even do these meetings? What is the purpose of this meeting? And this purpose is actually it's rooted in our uh, in CFR. NRCS has established a technical committee in each state to assist in making recommendations relating to the implementation and technical aspects of natural resource conservation activities and programs. <clears throat> so the purpose of this, the responsibility of the state technical committee is to provide information, analysis, and recommendations to USDA on conservation priorities, criteria for natural resource conservation activities and programs, including application and funding criteria, recommended practices, and program payment percentages. This is a committee that is set up to make recommendations to NRCS and to the state conservationists on what are we doing in the state. We can talk about just how if you have recommendations for NRCS specifically, if you've been hearing things that NRCS is doing, if you think are great, if you think NRCS has room for improvement, this is the opportunity to come forward and let us know is there's things that we need to change to make sure that we're addressing the needs of South Dakota. And it does not have to be just limited to your attendance in this room or virtual. If you have feedback for NRCS for this committee, we've actually placed a parking lot on the back wall there. And if you have some thoughts or you have some agenda items that you'd like to be put on the next agenda for state tech, we have some sticky notes, looks like on each one of these tables here, write down the topic that you'd like to have discussed the next state tech meeting. And when you have an opportunity to stick it on that back wall. And we'll make sure that, that we're either gonna add it to the next agenda or we'll have one of our specialists reach out to, to you to help you or help talk about that particular topic. We want to make sure that we're addressing the needs, the issues, the comments that you all have. That's what this meeting is for. One last thing regarding this meeting. This is kind of a special meeting because has, has anybody heard of, of FACA, the Federal Advisory Committee's Act? Does anybody know what that is? I'm sure you know what this is. Oh, well, okay. So, <laughs> FACA is a, is a law that limits or controls federal agencies' ability to seek advice. And normally, the only group that's allowed to provide advice to a federal agency are other federal agencies. And that's, and, or it has to be recorded or monitored through FACA. So it has to be monitored through Congress to make sure that, that agencies aren't seeking out a special group of people to just give them advice and just talk to one. It's supposed to be open to everybody. But there are some committees that are actually exempt from FACA. This is one of them. This is one of, ones, one of the ones that's called out specifically in the CFR that the State Technical Committee is exempt from FACA, and we are allowed to bring anybody. You don't have to be federal agents. You don't have to be any, You can be anybody who has a connection to natural resources to come into this room and give NRCS advice on how we should be running our programs in the state. And that really goes back to this agency is a locally led agency, and this is part the local process. This is part of us seeking advice from our entities and partners from across the state to figure out are we doing, are we going in the right direction or is there something to change? I encourage you as we work through this meeting today, if you have questions, this is the place to ask questions. 
if there are other topics, if, if we get towards the end of the meeting and your topic hasn't been discussed or you have concerns, please let us know so we can try to talk about those. We have I have a lot of my leadership team in the room today. I have a lot of experts here that should be able to answer questions that pop up. And if we can't, for whatever reason, we're going to take notes and we're going to give you an answer at a later time. So please take the opportunity to let us know what you're thinking, what the South Dakota need. Let's try to find some ways to address it. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the ones that are calling in online, but I really appreciate those of you who showed up here and here on also. I appreciate that you took the time to drive out here. So Colette, I'm going to hand this back to you. Actually, sorry, Steve, I'm going to give you an opportunity. So I want to make sure we acknowledge that Steve Dick, our state executive director with Farm Service Agency is here. I want to give him an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Tony. As Tony said, uh, my name is Steve Dick. I'm the state executive director for the South Dakota Farm Service Agency. And yes, I am a Coyote fan. Uh, very rare do I ever go to a meeting where I'm uh, where there's a sea of red shirts. Although I suspect that this similar meeting in uh, Nebraska, it would be I'd be in the right color for that. So, but I uh, just wanted to say uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to the NRCS for our working partnership. As you know, we have uh, 55 service offices. Each one of those offices has a, we have a partnership with the NRCS and the Conservation District. Uh, it's hand in hand. We work well together. As Tony mentioned, the increase of activity with NRCS, uh, that creates an increase of activity on our side, on the FSA side. You know, we're not the ones out front on the conservation programs, but it does increase the activity. My understanding is going forward because of the IRA, there is certainly some resources that come get transferred with interagency to help FSA with that. Um, you know, as you know, if you've gone to your FSA office now compared to maybe 20, 25 years ago, it's about half the number of people that work in there. Statewide, we have about 352 people. And one of the things, uh, like all agencies or like all people in rural America, rural South Dakota, you have a hard time attracting people to come work for the federal government. Now, it used to be it was the place to work in the, the community that you were in. That's not the case anymore. Um, the private sector offers benefits, although not as good as probably what the USDA employees have. But one of the big things that's happened within FSA in the last three months is the, the Program technicians, the people in the front office, the people that make our agency tick, they've been reclassified as program analysts now, and they their pay grade has bumped up a little bit. So now we're actually competitive with NRCS. We uh, hopefully aren't going to lose as many people from our agency to NRCS, but but that does happen. It's once in a while we get some of them to come over to our side, but it's been a major change on how. USDA Farm Service Agency works with its staff. Uh, nationwide, there's about 10,000 FSA employees. Like I said, 350 here in South Dakota spread across 55 service offices. So, you know, we look for, we, we love that working relationship we have with all the partners, particularly with the NRCS. You're going to hear a little bit later on from Owen Fagerhog, who is our conservation program director, and Dawn and Byer here to get a little bit more into the weeds on the CRP numbers. You know, the recent uh, grassland CRP program that was announced, we had roughly 158,000 acres, I believe. We were in the number four in the state. You Typically, we've been as high as one or two with that. So that says to me that producers are serious about conservation in South Dakota. They know what those programs are. They utilize them. You know, we can't be in the top all the time because we have so many acres that have been signed up already. So... It's, it's a great program, uh, thanks to all of the folks here. Lastly, I would just touch on, you mentioned about input from people outside of federal government. We do that on the county level with our county committees. I'm sure some of you folks who here probably served on a county committee. Uh, it truly is about as local as you can get uh, when you've got producers sitting in that USDA service center once or twice a month, you know, looking at the policy and how it's gonna impact producers, their neighbors with that. So with that, I'll turn it back to Colette here. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Okay, we will do, um, I would like to go around so we know who was in the room. Um, and would you like to do some opening remarks or would, shall we do introductions? I think we should maybe, we'll go ahead and do some introductions of the people around the room. So if you would please, uh, well, Tony's introduced himself 
And then we'll uh, just start over here and have you uh, introduce yourself and your organization. We'll go around quickly and then we'll do some uh, an update. Action here. Thank you. I'm John Arinka, and I serve as the Market Development Research Director for South Dakota Soybeans. Good morning. I'm Kent Blager, State Soil Health Specialist with the NRCS. Good morning. I'm Bruce Toy, the Panther Conservation Program for Ducks and Lake in South Dakota. Good hey, morning, everyone. Toy Lake, I'm from uh, South Dakota Agricultural Land Trust. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Miles from the South Dakota Special Food Producers Association. <laughs> Uh, Center to the office. Owen Tiger Conservation Reserve Program Manager here for the Farm Service Agency. Uh, John Tiger Conservation Program Specialist with the Farm Service Agency. Neil Foster, South Dakota Crop Service Association. Kyle uh, Nestor, also with South Dakota Crop Service Association. <laughs> Morning, Mark Norton. So, go to Game Fish and Parks. I'm the Hunting Access and Farm Bill Coordinator based out of here. Uh, Chris Dozer, Non Point Source Coordinator for the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources. David Flannery, I'm the Eastern Program Manager for the NRCS. Alan Graves, uh, the Assistant State Conservationist for Programs here out of here with the NRCS. I'm the topic on the Assistant State Conservation is for compliance with NRCS. So, let me lead you. I am Tim Reedy, I'm the State Conservation Engineer with NRCS here in Huron. Morning, I'm Michelle Berg, the Assistant State Conservationist for Field Operation based out of Brookings, covering the eastern third of South Dakota. I'm Jessica Mahalski, State Resource Conservationist for South Dakota NRCS. Marcia Danahee, I'm the state agronomist for ARC. Mark Larson with US Fish and Wildlife Service. And Brian Thompson, I, or, excuse me, a hydrologist with the US Geological Survey in Huron. Good morning, I'm Jewel Board, and I work on Central RCD. Shane Larson, I'm a public affairs manager with NRCS based out of Huron. Good morning, Daryl Duvall. Outreach coordinator here in Huron with NRCF. Thank you, with that easily. I'm Mike Morata. I'm a public affairs specialist here at the Huron office of the NRCS. I'm Colette Kessler, the assistant state conservationist for partnership at the state office in Huron. I would like to also have the people um, who are online identify themselves. If you'd come off mic and uh, tell us your name and organization, please. Matt Gottlob, State Coordinator, Pheasants Forever. Cindy Zink, South Dakota Soil Health Coalition. Paul Wepicker, Isaac Walton Lee. Mike Larson, Assistant State Conservationist for Field Operations for the Peer Area. Trevor Santerman, Northern Prairie's Land Trust uh, Director. Laura Kaler, South Dakota Grasslands Initiative Director. Sarah Newman, Administrative Assistant, NRCS. Good morning, Danielle Ryan, Conservation Stewardship Program Manager for NRCS. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Jim Blue. I'm the Rebecca Go ahead. Blue, Project Coordinator for the Engaging Women Cooperative Agreement. I'm Jennifer Wirtz. I am the Environmental Quality Incentive Program Manager for NRCS. Hi, I'm Jamie Furman. I'm the Resource Unit Conservationist for the Northwest Resource Unit, and I'm representing the Rapid City area. Good morning, right. I'm Tammy Burmeister, the Executive Assistant to the State Conservationist of South Dakota for NRCS. Hi, I'm Matt Morlock. I'm the RCPP Program Coordinator for South Dakota NRCS. Hi, I'm Tammy Moore with the um, South Dakota Association of Conservation District Employees.
Tony Hagen with AgriVive Biologicals. Hi, everyone. I'm Tina Jenin. I am the Executive Director of Sisseton Wapaton Oyate. Okay, excellent. Uh, did we catch everyone online? Is there anyone left that have not identified themselves? Cassie Ox. Oh, sorry, Colette. Cassie Ox, biologist with Ducks Unlimited. Thank you. Welcome, Kathy. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us here today. And now we have some an, an important uh, update, right? So I'll pass the microphone here to our our yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, Ben Reddy, the Center of Foods Office. I'm based in Sioux Falls. It's actually been a handful of years since I've been to this meeting. I used to do it quite regularly, and then everything kind of shifted to online, and that was actually quite convenient for our DC staff uh, to join online um, because they're the ones that are in the middle of it all in DC when it comes to ag policy or conservation policy or whatever else is going on in DC at the time. So. Uh, but on that note, Ryan Donnelly, who had been, well, we had Lynn Churchman and then Ryan Donnelly. Uh, Ryan Donnelly, who a lot of you have met, and he'd been on these calls uh, the last couple of years. Uh, he has moved on from our office, and we now have a new uh, staff member that handles our egg and conservation policy. Uh, her name is Ashlyn Beninga. Uh, she was on our staff previously, left to go work on, uh, she was Ryan's assistant, and then she went to go work for another Senate office. And now she's back on our staff. She's from just south of Harrisburg uh, in the southeast part of the state. Um, I know some of you have already met her, A, in the past, or B, recently, because she spent most of our August recess traveling across the state, talking to a number of the partners in the ag and conservation world uh, throughout the state, and uh, she joined us. I know she had a chance briefly, I think, to maybe say hi to Tony at Dakota Fest, um, but uh, she's been up. She's on our staff. Also, Kate Lumberg. Um, from our office handles these issues. She was back in the state as well. Uh, they had meetings in D.C., uh, so they weren't able to join, so I said I could pop up to Huron at least for a little bit of this meeting before doing some other meetings up in the region. Uh, but just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, D.C. is back in session. The Senate's back in session. They spent the month of August, or most of the month of August and last week out of session. We like to call it August recess or the district work period, whatever sounds better to you, I guess. Um, the Senator had a chance to get across uh, most of the state, not all of it, uh, but uh, a lot of different things, a lot of different opportunities to talk to folks across the state, specifically when it comes to what I would call farm bill conversation. Uh, the congressional delegation did a panel uh, at Dakota Fest in Mitchell. I, I know Tony was, was there and others probably in this room were at least part of that at least some point in time. Uh, he also did a, a listening session uh, up in Aberdeen at the Brown County Fair. So those are the two specific events when it comes to ag conservation policy that he did during the August recess. As I mentioned, the Senate and the House are both back in. Uh, the House today is supposed to take up a uh, continuing resolution vote. At least that's what I last read this morning. Um, it actually would take, it's uh, six months to August, they would take it into March. I don't know if it's got the votes to pass when it comes to the House, I don't try to prognosticate what is and isn't going to happen. Um, whatever they do will determine what type of Senate action uh, will follow that. The House typically goes first when it comes to spending measures. The reason I bring that up is because zero of the 12 spending bills have been passed by Congress. They're all expiring after the end of this month, so they have to do something. Um, on the House side, I can tell you they've actually passed a lot of them individually, even within, within through the whole House. The Senate, has passed all of their um, spending bills in committee, but not one of them has re received the vote on the Senate floor. So what do we have to do? We have to do a continuing resolution again, whether that's something that puts it out, they'll pass the election, out in the next, next year, still up in the air, kind of depends on what they're able to get through on the House. It's kind of where things stand. I know that's important because when you're looking at trying to fund the agencies that some a lot of folks in this room and online work for, uh, that's you know that's federal spending, that's the government funding programs, and so we'll look. There's there's no reason why we have to shut down the government. So hopefully they can get a CR, you know, whether it's a three week one, one past the election, one next year. We don't care. We just need to get something to 
continue operations. Um, on that note, September 30, also a big day when it comes to the farm bill. It expires again. We're operating under an extension right now. It expires again September 30. They're not passing the farm bill in the next three weeks. I can tell you that. No one's not getting signed into law. Um, if it did, well, that'd be crazy. Um, I just don't see that happening. Um, so the question is, how long did they kick it uh, extended out to? Um, my guess is they'll do a one year extension again. Um, I would. The House has introduced the version. The Senate has introduced their version. The House Act has actually passed their version of the, of the Farm Bill. I just don't see either that passing the full House and the full Senate, considering we haven't you know passed it anywhere in the uh, Senate side of things. I think September 30 for sure. I don't know if something can be done after the after the election winged up Congress. There's always a chance, I guess, but right now my understanding is um, staff from both parties on the Senate side are actually working on how to pass a one-year extension, which would put it again to September 30 next year, which would then just give some time. They could still redo it before then, but that way you're not going deadline to deadline to deadline. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they do either when they do this CR, they could tack on a one-year extension of the foreign bill. I think that's probably the most likely side, especially in the Senate. But we'll see because you never know what the House will decide to do. Um, that's kind of the update right now. It's election year. As everybody here knows, I, I didn't watch the debate last night, but I'm sure some did. Um, I kids football. But um, the that kind of just changes what Congress does and doesn't do. They're, they're probably only in for three weeks. And then my guess is they're out both the House and Senate for all of October. So um, I stopped and to change on that. We'd obviously let you know, especially when it comes to conservation programs. Um, but that's really all I got. If you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, my boss likes to say accusations, more than happy to take them. Um, if, you, if you have any now or know how to get a hold of our office as well. <coughs> Okay, thanks. All righty. Okay, so um, I, I kind of, one of the things when I look at this meeting, I we think about you know, people, there's a lot of P's in this in this meeting. People, we've had some great updates um, on that side. And then we'll have preservation practices, which will be an update from our ecological sciences section next. And then after um, after the practice of will be our programs update with preservation programs of the, the Farm Service Agency and of the NRCS. So with that, I welcome um, following along on the agenda. It will be the Ecological Science Update with Jeffrey Gamnowski, our state resource conservationist. Okay, I'll be I'll be pretty brief here. Um, I am passing around an update, so everybody's got a written document. Um, like Tony said. Uh, 150 employees with less than three years of experience. They need training. Um, so my staff uh, largely spends their time um, between um, March or April and this time of year training staff. Obviously, we need to be out in the field uh, doing that for the majority of our training sessions. So you can see the list of training sessions that we held and that we held, hold pretty much every fiscal year. Um, we're also going to be, uh, obviously, with the addition of Victor Tushin as our state economist, uh, we're going to be adding an economics training, and we'll actually hold that in February. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be outside for that one, so um, try to sp spread our training out a little bit. We'll be holding an economics and conservation planning course that I think is, is probably long overdue. We haven't had an economist in South Dakota for well over 10 years, I believe was when Doug Vick maybe left. I don't know for sure on the date, but um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, again, the, our trainings are open to our partners. So if you have staff that you would like to attend the training, um, just let me know and we'll get them on the list. Um, we we want to make sure that we're getting our, our partners trained up as well. Um, so we offer, we pretty much always have slots open for partners as well. Um, also wanted to touch on the conservation practice standards on the ecological science inside of the house that will be updated in October. Um, we've got three forestry practices. We are adopting um, the feed management 
practice um, and, and have the implementation requirements document pretty much ready to go there. Um, that practice um, kind of came about as a push through one of our RCPP um, <coughs> projects and then also maybe a, a new proposal um, to adopt that practice. So thanks to Marsha Deneke for her work on getting that practice standard um, ready to release. Um, we also have, we're gonna have a, a new high tunnel implementation guide. Obviously high tunnels has been a very popular conservation practice in South Dakota now for several years. So we needed to update um, an implementation guide for that. We've got a couple updates to some of our woodland technical notes. Uh, we have a new woodland technical note related to um, food and cover values for wildlife. Um, and then we're updating our conservation tree and shrub group list, which again is probably pretty long overdue um, without having a state forester, but now we've got a state forester um, or a Bosworth. So normally we, we used to maintain a list of people that wanted to look at those draft uh, standards and um, other tech guides and, and we kind of don't, don't have, we haven't kept that list up to be honest. Um, so if you want to look at any of these draft documents, um, please just shoot me an email, text, give me a phone call, whatever, and we'll get those to you if you want to take a look at them um, before we finalize those in October. And then lastly, I just wanted to, um, we've had a few additions to my staff. So you've got a list of ecological sciences staff there at the end. Um, I'm getting teased a little bit about um, kind of growing the, <laughs> growing my staff a little bit, but it's but it's been good, and I think we would definitely with a, uh, the addition of an economist and a forester here within the last couple of years, uh, that's really helped um, on the technical side of the house. So, with that, if there's are there any questions for me? All right. If not, I'll turn it back to Colette. Thank you, Jessica. Next on the agenda, we have the comic who is our Assistant State Conservationist for Compliance for NRC South Dakota. Let's start with Jay, you're kind of NRCS, Jessica is an NRCS. Now, um, you don't have anything in your pack now, you get it on a post report showing the outline and data that we have. Um, overall, compliance, I don't know if you've been here long enough, it used to be exciting, it's pretty boring right now. Um, our workload varies between 200 to determinations that might be outstanding that we need to complete. I think we're actually whittled it down to like 100, but it'll bounce right back up after harvest, I my guess. Um, highly rollable land that ebbs and flows across the state. Um, that's not as, I guess, difficult to do those determinations compared to certified wetland determinations. But outside of that, are there any questions that anybody has about compliance anymore? Otherwise, I think I don't have a job. <laughs> so just ask me anything, like, yeah. or if there's any data you want to see, I don't know if I can get it. You know, outside of here's our outstanding numbers of determinations, or here's the potential violations that we're working on, or any of that. Um, age of backlog is maybe four months at best. I mean, we get our outliers that require either a person wants us to work closer with them on their property, or requires us to be on site. But for the most part, everything's in and out the door relatively quick. Yes, sir. Did you, um, have you guys uh, compiled any numbers or results for the a wetland mitigation bank credits and stuff like that that have happened over the last you know, five years or so? Yeah, I mean, I would like to, we need to get a presentation done on it because we do have several ag banks that are out there. Um, they're pretty successful and the banks are getting better. When you look where the banks started, it was kind of difficult finding sites and you know, people questioned where they're suitable sites. And now the South Dakota Web Exchange is really on board and they really know what we're looking for. They're finding good stuff. But I think that'd be something that I can get a hand out on just the banks that we've had sold out and closed and the banks that we got going. But I, I will bring up when I do send that out, you know, like the bank site plans, please comment. Um, I take note of that. I mean, I know some people think they need more of a response, you know, for what they're stating, but it does help me understand what people are wanting. Um, so don't hold back. If you got any concerns on any of those bank site plans? 
I think that is a good deal. I'd like to get an actual presentation done on that sometime by the wetland exchange on their success. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive where it's, where it's gone to now. Anything else? Maybe I can get a job on Maholski's NRCS. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hire you, Lee. Thanks. Thanks, Deke. It's really great to hear. Thank you for working in that department and keeping things moving smoothly. It's great. So, awesome. So, another big category we have for NRCS on the technical side is um, under engineering. So, with that, I'd welcome Jim Reedy, our state conservation engineer, up here for an uh, update. Thank you. Thanks, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. I don't have a printout for your packet either, but I'll be sure I get a copy of this to Randy after the fact. So I have it. Um, I've been work going on with the uh, state office engineering staff right now. We also are working on updates to several conservation practice standards. We have seven of them where the national version is newer than the current South Dakota version on the tech guide. And those are, I'll list them real quick, composting facility, structure removal, Bond sealing and lining for a geomembrane or geosynthetic clay liner, drainage water management, saline and sodic soil management, which is an engineering practice for some reason, but just the staff and ecological scientists use this a lot more than the engineers do. Uh, wetland creation and wetland enhancement are also being updated. And then we have an eighth standard for livestock shelter structure that we're just doing a simple removal of one of the tables. It does not have a newer national version. But we're just working on getting that uh, updated to remove a table. We're kind of taking the route with these practice standards. We don't have to, or we don't want to include a lot of detail within the standard itself. We want the standards to remain fairly generic. So we have to update them every five years. It's a little easier during that five year update process. And then we reference specific technical information outside the standard. So that's the goal with that livestock shelter structure. I actually don't have any real good insight and knowledge as far as the differences specifically right now between those new national and current state standards. But uh, if anyone has any questions on any of them, I can certainly have found the answers very quickly for my staff. Uh, update on emergency watershed protection, EWP program, uh, flood disaster assistance. We did submit what we call an electronic disaster report to national headquarters for the June flood event that hit Southeast South Dakota. And we have a couple of active sponsor requests that came in through that. Um, South Dakota NRCS, we can jump the gun just a little bit with our submittal of our EDR or disaster request to headquarters. We actually submitted that because of timelines and specific windows of so many days after a disaster, so many days after sponsors start asking for help. And so we submitted that with the disaster date of July 1, uh, fully expecting that we have a federal disaster declaration within a couple of weeks after that. But the way things unfolded through July and August, <clears throat> and because the federal disaster wasn't declared until August 15th, so it's quite a ways out, it took a long time for that federal disaster to come true, we actually decided to request an extension from headquarters. It would give us a little bit longer than the requirement of within 60, 60 days of a sponsor request to complete what we call damage survey reports. Their actual site is to do damage surveys. And so far, we've received requests for assistance from two sponsors, one being the TLC Vermillion River Water District for a couple of sites along the Vermillion River, and then uh, also one from South Dakota Game Fishing Parks for Emmett Lake. So we are in the process of completing the DSRs for those sites, and our extension has moved us out to be, have time to complete the DSR work uh, by October 23rd. So that's in progress right now. My staff and uh, Rigging's area staff and peer area staff, we're all working on that. Watershed operations. Update on watershed operations. We have a project requesting from the city of Mitchell. I'm sure a lot of folks are aware of that. It's on Firesteel Creek. We're seeing some progress. We have a preliminary investigation finding report, or what we call a PIFR, which is just a cursory review to let us know if there are any insurmountable obstacles to the watershed project. The PIFR is ready to roll, but during the development of the PIFR and talking with our National Watershed Programs Branch, uh, we found out that 
we thought there was an acreage limit of 250,000 acres that applied to a watershed project. We've since learned Congress has kind of tweaked with the appropriations law. Every time we have a new CR, a new appropriations bill come out, they tweak the language that says the only reason we need to worry about the 250,000 acre limit is if the project purpose is strictly flood prevention, putting in a big dam. And that's not what the city of Mitchell wants to do. They already have a dam. They already have Lake Mitchell. They want to work on improvements and practice installations that will help trap and capture nutrients and sediment in the watershed. So their purpose is actually due to watershed protection. There's no acres from it on that. So we're like, okay, about 400 roughly thousand acres within the Firestone Creek watershed. But city of Mitchell does not have jurisdiction, tax levy authority, or eminent domain authority over all of those watershed acres. So we're going to backpedal a little bit. My watershed program manager, Daniel Ostrom, and myself, we're doing as much as we can on the educational side with water development districts and counties, attending board meetings, commission meetings, public meetings. Uh, there's been a lot of that going on all this summer. We're making progress. We have a couple more partnering sponsors that we call sponsoring local organizations, or SLOs, who are signing on. Uh, we have Doral County. We're working on working with Aurora County. And the James River Water Development District is meeting this week with uh, potential approval as a sponsor on their agenda tomorrow, actually. Joe Schrader, the Public Works Director and City Engineer with the City of Mitchell. Uh, he's been great to work with. We're uh, hopeful this project is going to go past paper stage and into planning. When we request for funding to the national level through our WP program, it's a congressionally directed. It's not Farm Bill, it's its own program. And we would, NRCS would fund 100% uh, of the planning with that watershed, so I'm optimistic. And then Jess also talked about training. I'll touch on that a little bit. A lot of new staff on board. We're hearing that a lot today. Uh, we held a very successful annually, we hold this annually, basic survey and design class in Pier at the end of July. We trained 21 field staff, most of whom are new employees. I found out when I was there the first three days that they've only been with us for less than a year. So that was good. We'll be spending some time this winter looking at making a few changes to the class, potentially uh, offering it more often throughout the year. It's very intensive. It's a week-long class, and it kind of gets into the weeds. And I want to sit down this winter and talk with my staff and area staff about maybe revamping it a little bit more towards the inventory evaluation and planning side of things. We did do a, the livestock water session, water portion of that, with the fishing parks back in, I think it was late May, end of May. That was very well received. So more work to come on that. We we'll get together and figure that out and continue training all our new folks. That's all I have. Anybody have any questions for me? All right, thank you. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Okay, um, with the uh, all the awesome practices that are happening across the landscape, we are thankful that we have a variety of programs that can help us with with uh, helping to finance those practices. So with that, I am inviting our uh, friends from uh, the Farm Service Agency for an update uh, on their uh, conservation programs. Thank you, Owen. Morning, everyone. Uh, again, I don't have any visual displays or handouts, just kind of more information to, to share. Um, the last State Tech Committee, I shared total contract acreage under CRP. We're still holding about that two and a half million, uh, 2.447 to be exact. High percentage of that is our grassland CRP sign up, our working lands. There's about 1.5 million in that sign up. Uh, and then closely followed, not closely, but followed by our regular continuous, about 500,000 acres. Um, Probably the biggest lift we have in front of us is the last three weeks of the fiscal year. So we're wrapping up all of our signups with the, the continuous, the grassland signup, uh, general signup offers. They all become effective. So grasslands in general have to have an October 1 start date, so we have to have those completed. Uh, total activity for the state under the, all of the signups was about 3,000 offers made statewide. Uh, we've got about 1,526 of those yet to get across the finish line the last weeks of September. No pressure in RCS. But um, 
hopeful that we're going to get there. Uh, we will get there. Um, but again, as the, the staff are indicated, our authorities run out September 30th at this current time and date. So we're kind of scrambling. Uh, along with the CRP activities, we've got uh, kind of a unique factor in the state of South Dakota. We've got extreme drought in the western tier, and we had extreme flooding in the southeast part of the state. So we're conducting ECP signups, emergency conservation program signups for drought and flood con concurrently within the state of South Dakota. Uh, sprinkling a few wildfires. We've got some of that going on in the northwest part of the state, some initiated signups for wildfire under ECP. Um, so a lot of things going on, you know, on the landscape, helping producers with the with the disaster units. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of just a quick overview. Are there any questions Farm Service Agency related on the conservation side for myself? Mark Norton. Hey, on, on, on ECP, what are the primary practices or, or things that ECP is helping producers out with in both the drought situation and the flood situation? So the question is what EC practices, emergency conservation practices, are we implementing within those disaster areas? So when we're looking at the western area with the drought and the wildfire, uh, drought's going to be for emergency water, so the EC6 practice. So we're going to help with installation of pipelines and tanks, uh, drilling some wells if needed. Uh, eligibility is going to be based on what the prior water source was and that it failed due to the drought. So if it's just a maintenance issue, we're not going to be able to help in those situations, but it has to be drought related. The wildfires, most of the impact there is going to be on fence. So our EC3 practice is going to be what we install for help with installation and repairing the fences. The southeast part of the state with the flooding, we're still going to have the fence repair or the Fences were washed out, but then silt and sediment removal is probably the biggest one. Uh, we had a lot of the area along the Vermilion River. We had some breaches of the dike, uh, a lot of sand and silt deposited on the cropland adjacent to that, that area. Uh, so some big dollars, a lot of work for those participants, producers to get that cropland back into production, bring it back to a functioning environment i guess um that answer your question um, yeah. anything else thank you very good thanks Ellen. okay um and with that we'll move over to the nrcs conservation programs of the farm bill and we have Alvin praise who will lead this section thank you good morning they let me come back for a second meeting so um, I am Val DeFreeze, assistant for programs with the NRCS here. I'm, I'm trying to fill the shoes vacated by Jeff Vanderbilt, who was in the role for many years. So happy to be back. Uh, from a programs perspective, it's been a very successful year in South Dakota with programs, as Tony touched on before. Um, the field offices have worked really hard uh, to complete obligations. Our demand to obligate them more dollars is very valid, but we've also had a larger demand for more diverse practices. We're supporting a lot larger customer base. So the field offices are really working hard and doing a good job um, with those with those demands. Uh, just a few kind of figures relative to our programs. Um, even though we've obligated a lot more dollars this year than we did last year and the year before, we're still only able to fund about a third of our applications. So there's still a strong demand for applications within the state. Um, at Bolt's numbers, and we obligated double the amount of money this year than we did in 2022. So our growth has been fast and we are able to take it on. You know, it's been a huge, a huge lift. The offices are doing well. Um, we couldn't do it without the help of our partners and everybody collaborating, coming together uh, to help find that success. Uh, we need to stick together. We've got, you know, another year or two of, of growth coming, but a lot of opportunity for the state and um, for not only conservation, but, the, you know, a lot more landowners. So 
Uh, the next couple of years were looking good. So we obligated, um, you know, like Tony said, it, around that 90 million mark for EQIP, CSP, and RCPP. So as we look towards 2025, there's a few things we're going to need to navigate. Uh, the first being, you know, the farm bill. What's going to happen with the farm bill? Um, we've got some payment limitation issues that we run up against with some of our applicants, and it's a barrier to some of the program participation. So we'll see what happens with the farm bill here at the end of the month and hope for the best. We've got some rough timelines uh, established for fiscal 25. Our uh, program batching date is November 1st. So on November 1st, we're gonna take all of the applications that we've received to that date and consider them for fiscal 25 um, program application evaluations. Our anticipated ranking dates uh, will start in January and probably go through the end of March. So we have a state or a, a subcommittee meeting next week uh, within the agency to establish and finalize some of those timelines. So, um, in addition, we've got a national water quality initiative that we are kicking efforts off in this year. It's in the Dawson Creek area, so that's down um, from Trip. You go south and east uh, to Scotland, and we've got some funds allocated to be used in that air that area uh, to avoid, control, and trap sediment, nutrients, and other impairments uh, for the water quality efforts down there. So I am also joined by uh, some program managers today. They are virtual, and then David Flannery is is here with us today, and we're going to roll into some very some uh, program specific reports. So I'm going to start with uh, Equip. So I've got Jennifer Wirtz, our program manager, on on our team's call, and she's going to present uh, the. Equip report, it should be in your packet. So it's looking like it's page page four. Page four. So that will turn over to Jen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh this is just a kind of quick summary of where we are with equip obligations for fiscal year 24. Uh, there are two sets of these. One is for the classic funding or our general funding, and then the other is on the IRA. So the one that I'm sharing right now is the classic funding. Um, from when we got these reports made up, we did um, this allocation returned number. We got the okay to go ahead and use that within the state, so that will be added into our final allocation uh, and final obligations amounts, um, all but about $3,000 of that has been used since last week when this was made up. Uh, number of applications isn't really changing. We had a couple of cost increases and some modifications that will use some of that funds. Uh, just like in past years, the funding breakdown goes by fund pool. Um, this page here has the nationally funded initiatives and the state driven initiative fund pools. Uh, and it, then it goes into the breakdown by the tribal funds and the area offices, area resource units. Uh, and you can see you know what what each of them had for allocation and, and number of total funded applications there. So the summary here, um, we're going to end up with about 237 contracts with the classic funds. And we're right at 99, almost 100% obligation for the classic funds that we had in the state this year, which is just slightly higher than classic funding that we had in fiscal year 23, um, but all said and done. Uh, the next set of handouts is the IRA funding handouts. Uh, the, this does break into the CISs, and I forgot to go to that page on the Classic. The Classic had some of the CIS projects were funded with Classic funds. Some of the CIS projects 
were funded with IRA funds. So they were just two different sets of um, CIS projects. They are the same projects that have continued from prior years. There was no new CIS projects in fiscal year 24. Uh, again, this just breaks down the summary of IRA funding. Uh, and again, we are right on par to be at that 99 to 100% of obligation when it's all said and done. We've got just a few applications left to go um, to get to obligation. And we're going to be just over um, $44 million in EQIP obligations this year, which is, is wonderful. A uh, number of IRA funded contracts are going to be at that 361 uh, in total. So again, we're going to be well over 500 applications for EQIP, which is oh, about double what we've had in past years. So like Valid said, we have those, those batching dates coming up. Um, payment schedules are in the works. We should have our payment schedules in October. Um, they should be posted. And is there any other questions for EQIP? All in all, this was an excellent year. Our staff did wonderful. Our partners did wonderful in getting applications across the finish line um, and just getting through the, the number of applications that we did have. I got a question for you, Jennifer. Yes. Is there a... Uh... Is there any difference in the practices that are being funded with the IRA pot of money versus the classic pot of money? Are we seeing that there's something that IRA yes. is? Um, yes, there, there is, and bear with me here. I am going to open an email real quick. Um, so this, this here is, uh, the practices that were designated as the climate smart practices. Uh, so this was, uh, it's posted, I believe, on our website as well. Um, and there is a climate smart op, um, link in there. This has all of the practices that are deemed climate smart. These are the practices that uh, for both EQIP and CSP, would be the climate smart or the IRA focused practices. So these would have to be our primary practices that we're funding in IRA. Uh, it just goes through, I'll just scroll through slowly through this. Uh, these would be our primary. We can also do practices to support these primary practices. So when we get down to prescribed grazing, um, there's a lot of pipeline and cross fencing um, tanks going in to support the prescribed grazing. So that that does, um, it basically makes it to be the same practices in classic funding, but there has to be a primary practice on this list that we are supporting with any other practice in the contract. If that makes sense or answers your question a little bit i'm just curious if if in south dakota there's something that we're doing with ira that we're not doing with classic is there or are they just a lot of the same practice i in my mind they're the same but I'm i would say they're they're pretty much similar i would i would say like their egg waste systems most likely we'll never get to IRA funding at this point. Um, most of the practices that are going in under an ag waste system for treatment of manure are not deemed IRA practices. Uh, so we wouldn't be using IRA funding to fund ag waste, but most everything else that we accomplish under EQIP can be accomplished with IRA. Uh, the, the biggest thing is, is most of these practices are either vegetative or management type practices. So if the producer is not willing to adopt those practices as primary and they only want to um, put in pipeline and water developments uh, or 
I'm drawing a blank on anything else that may not may go in right now that wouldn't be able to be linked to a management practice and funded through that. Uh, we could not use IRA funding if that was the case. So we have the producers have to be implementing one of these practices on this climate smart list. Which we do have a few where we fund in classic that are not, they're either not able to implement like nutrient management or prescribed grazing, um, or they are already implementing one of those practices through maybe another funded contract. Uh, and we can't pay again on that practice through an IRA funded contract. So then it would not be eligible for IRA funding. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Jen? Oh, this mm -hmm. is the list for 2024. They just released the list for 2025. There, I don't believe any of these practices have been removed from the 24 list in 25, but they did add a couple additional practices, and Jessica might be able to speak to that a little bit more if there's more questions on on IRA eligible practices. All right. Thank you, Jen. You're very welcome. All right, so uh, next we're gonna go to our conservation stewardship program. Danielle Ryan is going to provide that update and year end summary, Danielle, uh, is in week three of her new role. So we just hired Danielle as our conservation stewardship program manager. She's got uh, extensive experience with planning and working with producers in the field. So we're happy to have her join the programs team. I'll turn it over to you, Danielle. Good morning. You guys should have a one page handout in your packet. So we're just wrapping up our 2024 obligations. Uh, we just got a couple left, thankfully, uh, to get done. But you can see in the chart that this year we got about $3.3 million in our renewals. Um, we got about $37.2 million in our classic CSP obligated. Um, and then we did have our GCI, CSP GCI this year as well. Um, since we were still under that uh, 2018 farm bill. Uh, so right now we have about $28,000 obligated with that, but total when we're done, we'll probably have about $83,000 of that obligated. Um, so it was a pretty big year. Um, we got uh, classic 257 uh, contracts. So we got quite a bit done. Um, we will have an additional when we're done obligating another seven hundred and sixty six thousand dollars obligated. So um, including all of these twenty twenty four obligations, we have a thousand forty one active CSP contracts right now. So that's on two point nine million acres in South Dakota, which is huge. And just in twenty twenty four, we will be making twenty nine million dollars in payments. And that's just for our twenty twenty four. Uh, activities being completed this year. Um, along with that, we've got uh, 210 of those CSP GCI active contracts. Um, and just this year, we'll be making about $290,000 in payments for that. So we had a huge year. Um, the renewals that we had this year were affected by us being on that 2018 extension of the farm bill. We were <laughs> limited by the payment limitations. So we didn't have quite as many renewals this year. So we're hoping um, in the future we will get more uh, renewals uh, when they um, up the payment limitations. So uh, that'll improve in the future. Um, as far as 2025 planning for CSP, we've got 94 renewals on file right now to get through. Um, we've got 129 
2025 CSP applications to work on. And like Val mentioned, we're still taking applications until November 1st. So we're anticipating that that number will grow uh, quite a bit. And um, yeah, so we had a huge year for CSP and looking forward to working on everything in the future. Any questions for me? I'll do my best to answer them. All right, thank you, Danielle. All right, we're gonna now go to Matt Morlock for an RCPP update. <clears throat> this is going to be a slight change in your packet or your handouts. The next handout in your packet is this ASAP news release. We're gonna swing back to that after we do an RCPP update. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, but we'll do this virtually instead. And I will kind of give you an overview of our proposals that came in, um, just a quick rundown, and then we'll get to the meat and potatoes of it and have uh, Bruce Toy come up and talk about their ongoing project. Um, that's the really important thing is seeing how these are being implemented on the ground. So um, I'll quickly, let's see if I can get my computer to work. Quickly run through this current NFO that we just had closed for fiscal year 24. Um, like you've heard time and time again today, um, the the response from the partners was overwhelming, much like the producers. Um, we had a tremendous amount of interest this year on pr submitting proposals. Um, for South Dakota specifically, we had 16 proposals as a lead state come in. Um, this is compared to last year where we had seven. Um, so we more than doubled the proposals that came in for South Dakota as a lead state. Um, within those proposals, there was just over $241 million requested in funding, um, which is compared to $151 million last year. Um, a breakdown of that funding, there was um, about $150 million requested for easements in particular, um, the proposals that were focused directly on easement acquisitions. Um, so that's a good number to see in our state. That's a shows a huge interest in the easement programs. And then the remaining 90 million, just over 90 million was for land management and rental program activities. Um, we were also part of four proposals that we aren't a lead state in, um, whereas last year we were part of one of those. And out of those four, um, three of them, we probably won't see a lot of activity if they get funded. Um, we were just kind of a fallback state for them if they can't have success in their main state. Um, but the other one of them, yeah, we will have probably a lot of enrollment from it if that project gets selected. So that was good to see as well. Um, kind of another farther breakdown of these proposals. There's 10 of them that were submitted as RCPP classics and 10 of them that were alternative funding arrangement projects. Um, and within that, um, with the RCPP classics, there was two of them that were land management and rental and the other eight were easement focused. And on the AFAs, there was one easement submission and nine that were land management and rentals. Um, so a good breakdown there um, and kind of mirrors what happened nationally. Um, nationally, there was about 320 proposals submitted. Um, and they were equally it was surprising within about 10, app, 10 proposals of being totally equal between AFA and classic projects. Um, so that's what we want to see. That's what we like to see is an equal split between the two because that means they're both working fairly well. Um, there was over $5 billion in funding requests. Um, if you remember to the NFO, the funding opportunity that came out that I presented previously, um, there's $1.5 billion available through that NFO. So it was a lot of demand for the funds available. I mean, you start talking billions of dollars and you think 1.5 would cover it. Um, we had $5 billion come in. Um, if we follow what happened last year, and I'm not sure if we will or not, we have not heard anything from headquarters. They were able to find funds beyond the NFO initial amount and fund additional projects. Um, so hopefully that will happen in this case as well. Um, and we'll try to fund some additional projects past that 1.5 billion. Um, so that's what we saw in the proposal world. Um, where we're at on that timeline, well, I should back up and mention one other fact about the South Dakota projects that was nice to see was we did have four proposals come in that are historically underserved led, which we haven't seen before. Um, so these proposals are led by um, either agencies or NGOs that are historically underserved focused. So that's nice to see as well. Um, that's something we have not seen in the past. So that was encouraging. 
Um, where we're at on the timeline is the proposals have all been reviewed in state um, and we've made our suggestions. Um, and they're currently at headquarters being ranked by the headquarters team and looked over for eligibility issues and things like that. Um, from there, they will be sent off to the Chief Cosby's office um, and he will make that final determination. We're expecting to hear something on that in mid to late October as to what projects got funded. Um, that's all contingent on different things going on at, at DC and things like that. It's nothing is set in stone, um, but that's what we're expecting to see is mid to late October. So that's what I have for my end of this. Um, is there any questions out there for me? If not, I will turn it over to Bruce Toy and let him give a quick presentation on what they're doing with RCPP and their projects. Like I said, this is kind of the, the meat and potatoes of what you guys want to see. Um, this is this is RCPP on the ground in action, and this is what the program can do. Hopefully, I will spur on some ideas from other partners in the room um, for the next NFO that comes out and gives you an idea of how it can work for you guys. So with that, um, I can't see it on camera, but I'm assuming Bruce is up front and I will turn it to him. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, Bruce Toy, Manager of Conservation Programs with Ducks Unlimited. And uh, Matt asked me to talk about how we've been using RCPP uh, in South Dakota, and I've been pretty heavily involved the last uh, five years, so I'll try to keep this under an hour for you. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Uh, just a little bit about Ducks Unlimited. We're, we're a nonprofit wetlands conservation organization started in 1937. Uh, a lot of our followers recognized declining. Uh, duck populations and wanted to do something about it. Uh, so since that time, we've always talked about the prairie potable region that you see there in the stifled red. Uh, more than two thirds of the continent's waterfall comes from that area. Uh, so we re reiterate to our constituents uh, and, and volunteers and donors that if we want ducks in the fall, uh, we got to prioritize uh, conservation right here. And then just taking a little further, uh, a deeper dive into the Dakotas here, this is one of the models we use to prioritize where do we work. Um, these models are based on densities of small shallow wetlands and, and adjacent grasslands for breeding habitat. Uh, those darker pinks and purples there uh, will provide uh, you know, up to more than 100 breeding pairs per square mile under good, under good breeding conditions. So really some of the, some of the best, the best uh, duck habitat uh, in, in the world. Uh, also use this as kind of a, a risk assessment map. I mean, in my opinion, if you look over uh, to the eastern lobe over there, stretching down into central Iowa and southern Minnesota, those used to be highly productive waterfall habitats. Uh, but now 95% of the wetlands are gone. 99% of the grasslands are gone. Uh, consequently, <clears throat> they don't raise very many ducks. And they also have uh, issues with uh, flood control, erosion, uh, and water quality at the same time. The pressures that exist there continue to work uh, westward. Uh, so really it's in our best interest to do the best we can to, to keep what we have in terms of, of wetlands and grass and habitat. Also recognizing that, that this habitat is, you know, as we all know. Can I interrupt a second? They're asking to, to share to share your screen. Oh, yeah. How do I do that? We're going to try to share the screen here for the folks online once that happens. Thank you. Okay, so now that's good. Okay. There we go. Can you all see that? Can you get hand, hands up from somebody? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. That's not Yeah. That's, as I was saying, in eastern half of South Dakota, uh, most of that is, is owned uh, by, by private landowners and utilizing agricultural, agricultural production. Uh, and we still have uh, these millions of small shallow wetlands and grasslands there. Uh, we need to be working with those producers, uh, finding ways uh, to, to maintain agricultural productivity and, and keep those habitats intact at the same time. If we're going to achieve our vision of wetlands sufficient to fill the skies with waterfall today, tomorrow, uh, and forever. And really one of the best ways to do that, there's a couple more clicks on this one to get our text up there. Uh, um, and really working with the livestock producers uh, is really the best the best way we can do that. Uh, ducks and cows need the same thing, grass and, 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 and water for, uh, for, for, for both critters. Uh, so we've been working with ranchers uh, considerably over the past uh, 10 years with our working lands model of conservation. So our staff are providing uh, financial and technical assistance to these ranchers. 
Uh, we're leveraging our philanthropic dollars that are raised across the country uh, with, with public funding sources like the North American Weapons Conservation Act. And now with RCPP, which has a, a lot of new opportunities to leverage our dollars. Uh, so starting about uh, eight, eight years ago uh, with the, after the 2014 Farm Bill, when RCPP first came out, we kind of dipped our toes in this and had our first project, which was the James River Watershed on RCPP. Uh, and back then, this was just the traditional route or what they now refer to as the classic version of RCPP. Uh, DU and our partners were, were delivering a, a wide variety of conservation in, in that target area of the James River watershed. And we leveraged that to bring an additional $2.3 million uh, to the NRCS to spend in, in, in EQIP and CSP programs that we've been doing uh, so far. At, at the same time, we had a, a multi-state proposal uh, at the same, uh, same time period. Uh, it included the Dakotas, Montana, and, and Minnesota, which eventually dropped out. But again, leveraging our resources to, to bring more dollars to these states for practices that we cared about and priorities that were important to us as well. So this, this worked out really great for us to leverage our resources. Um, um, but we did have some, some troubles uh, uh, reaching uh, all of the, the areas that we could. For example, in South Dakota, it was difficult for a partner uh, to have a, a program across all of eastern South Dakota coordinating with 44 different field offices with the NRCS. And we just wanted to be a little bit more involved in that in that delivery process. But in 2020, uh, when the notice of funding opportunity came out, they had the new alternative funding arrangement strategy, uh, which we were pretty excited about. And we put in a proposal there uh, for the three states, uh, South Dakota has the lead, North Dakota and Montana. Uh, back then the cap was uh, $10 million and we were awarded 8.7 million at that fall of 2020. Um, that's that's when the work started. Uh, there were no instruction manuals that came out with, with this new uh, model of RCPP funding. So it took us uh, about a year to kind of develop our first uh, programmatic partnership agreement. Uh, and then about another eight months or so before we got our supplemental agreements to actually obligate dollars to figure out how do, how do we make this work? Uh, how, do, how do we uh, you know, provide flexibilities for the partners, but also make sure that NRCS is able to uh, do all of the all of the due diligence that's required for for farm bill spending. We had a first sign up in August of 2022. Uh, we had uh, 14 applications across Eastern South Dakota, and we selected five. Uh, you know, ideally, we kind of wanted to have a uh, uh, um, kind of an act now philosophy and just take applications as as folks walk in. Uh, but recognizing this was a very new system, wanted to take a very cautious approach into how many applications we funded, and didn't want to get overwhelmed and, and over overspend our our uh, staffing uh, abilities. So we just funded five that, that first round, and then the second sign up about a year later, 17 applications and selected 11. And then we just had another sign up this past spring, uh, five applications and five, five were funded. That shows the geography there where we were focusing on, on the South Dakota portion of this project. Really what we we're trying to do um, was, was try to work with producers that were transitioning from conventional to more regenerative agricultural systems. Uh, find producers that were not very familiar with uh, cover crops, crop diversity, and, and, and were limited by abilities to get livestock uh, grazing infrastructure. You know, we all know that costs for, for fence and water are expensive, uh, both on grassland and, and cropland systems. Uh, we also had a new opportunity that was available through RCPP to offer a, uh, we call a grass establishment deferral payment. Uh, so not only letting, paying a producer to, to plant grass, on marginal cropland acres, but giving them a payment for the first three years, because it often takes at least that long for, especially these native mixes, to really get a hold and have any actual forage value. <clears throat> At the same time, not just delivering these practices, but by really focusing on on collecting data uh, on these projects and, and connecting our cooperators with some of the great mentors that we have in South Dakota with the Grassland Coalition, Soil Health Coalition, and Understanding Ag, another partner in this project. So just uh, an update of where we're at in South Dakota, total of 14 agreements uh, impacting just over 15,000 acres. So they're pretty, pretty big uh, projects averaging over a thousand acres in size. Uh, that's just about 1,400 acres of, of cropland seeded back to grass. Uh, these all have a five-year management plan for the cropland acres. It includes a, you know, a plan for crop rotation, including a small grain and or cover crops. Um, these are DU RCPP agreements, so it's a little different model than a typical EQIP contract. This is an agreement with Ducks Unlimited 
and we handle all of the associated planning and, and permitting duties with these projects. Uh, we've obligated $3.3 million in these South Dakota projects. And again, these agreements focus on soil data analyses and connecting these producers to educational opportunities. And our agreements typically have a, a five to 10 year commitment to keep their associated habitats intact, just to make sure we're getting you know, the, right, the right bang for a buck. We wanna make sure that we're putting a lot of work to plant this land back to grass, stays there for a, for a, a, recent, a decent duration. This just kind of shows where, where those projects uh, have, are, are occurring. Uh, Eastern South Dakota, if you think back to that priority map, we are we are working in the areas that we want to be working with and have a good uh, impact on, on waterfowl populations. And I'll just run, kind of run through a few examples of, of these projects. This one here is in, uh, is in Hand County. Uh, those are full sections there to give you a scale of the landscape there. The, the blue polygons are areas that were cropland and are being seeded back to grass. And you'll notice all the all the white areas in those cropland, uh, very very marginal and and, and saline soils. Uh, producers tired of putting in a lot of inputs and not getting a lot of outputs on these acres, and would just rather have that have that back in grass. Uh, and this this gentleman has flat out said that if, if he didn't have that grass deferral payment, he would not be able to make this work. He can't cash flow not have any income on 430 acres for three years. Uh, so that, was, uh, that really impacted his decision making, which is a, a, a big thing, I think, in, in our opinion. At the same time, those, those yellow hashed areas, that's, that's pretty good cropland for him. So we're going so to keep that in cropland and actually help them improve soil health by integrating cover crops and putting in some grazing infrastructure as well. Another example, this is just a half section. Uh, and it was cropland in the north half. Again, you see a lot of white areas. That you see up and down the, you know, the eastern tier of South Dakota. We're seeding that back in the grass, helping him put in the, the red lines or fence and putting in some water infrastructure so he can implement a nice rotational grazing system, both on the newly seeded acres and his existing adjacent native pasture. Another one here, uh, approximately 200 acres of native range. We're going to split that in two so we can rotate, rotate pastures and utilize the adjacent cropland acres uh, by integrating uh, multiple applications of small grains and cover crops over a five-year period and getting livestock, livestock on those acres too. And again, putting, putting fence around that and getting water to both sites. And then one of our newer sites up in Bay County, this was a cover crop only project, but uh, this producer was interested in, in uh, integrating multiple applications of cover crops uh, within the same year, uh, some of those acres. So using a, at first a, a cool season dominant uh, cover crop mix, and then a warm season dominant cover crop wet mix, and then using some temporary grazing infrastructure. So he's getting a cattle treatment on these acres multiple times per year, which worked out well in a year when we had a lot of moisture, like we did to get a lot of growth. So he's getting a lot of income on these acres and really boosting his soil health at the same time. Now a little update from North Dakota, they, they took a, a they waited a little bit, kind of let uh, South Dakota figure out the process. They were about a year behind us uh, in terms of delivery, uh, looking at about seven agreements and about 3,000 acres of impact, but uh, really leaning heavy on that grass restoration component. They're finding it very successful uh, in North Dakota as well for, for large grass restoration projects. And this is just one of their examples too, uh, almost 400 acres of, of cropland being seeded back to grass all kinds of fence needed to implement a rotational grazing system and, and, and water distribution to make that happen. And they just announced another sign up here in North Dakota. Uh, I think that with this last sign up, this will essentially obligate all of the remaining dollars in this RCEP work. Gotcha. There we go. And then just reiterating that not, not just delivering these projects, but also uh, collecting data on, on these sites kind of in a pre and post scenario. So as, a, as the soil health management plan starts, uh, collecting all these various uh, soil health data and then doing that again in years three, four, and five, and hopefully seeing some, some trends in the right direction and helping connect those metrics to, uh, you know, how we can, how that translates into, you know, reductions in inputs, uh, lower needs for fertilizers and herbicides and those sorts of things and how it impacts their long-term profitability because the goal here is you know they'll continue doing this after these projects are are complete. 
and also focusing on social outcomes. So we have questionnaires for all of our cooperators that help us gauge uh, you know, their perceptions on conservation goals and barriers and those sorts of things. So just recognizing the success that we had with the uh, uh, with that first project with the, with the grass establishment rental payment, uh, we we uh, wanted to really scale that up in South Dakota. So last fall we we put in we got a bunch of partners together and put in for the maximum award of twenty five million dollars uh, just for South Dakota. So that is uh, currently open for business. I have a lot of uh, brochures over here if anybody is interested. But but really. Uh, any interested producer can work with any of those partners on there uh, to develop a grass restoration plan and use that use that uh, deferral payment uh, to help them bridge the, that loss of income gap. And that's just a copy of what the, what the brochures are, and that's also in your in your handouts there too. It lists uh, you know the current uh, county average CRP rental rates, and a producer can either contact any of the field staff or those partners or scan that QR code and, and just get into a Google database and we'll, we'll bring it out. And just a shout out to the, this is my, our boots on the ground the staff that I supervise, these are the folks that are, that are leading some really incredible projects in South Dakota that have made this RCPP project successful. If anybody has questions, there's my contact information. You can sure reach out to me whenever or I have some time for questions right now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so, RCPP, a lot of those numbers that we had in our packet uh, presented earlier today don't include the partnership work that's being done through RCPP. So, there are millions of dollars being offered to producers across the state uh, through RCPP and our partner. Um, opportunities. So thank you, Bruce. Appreciate that. Um, I've got uh, David Flanner in here. He is our easement program manager. So he started with us in January? Uh, November. November. November 9th. Well, November 9th, and then we got you full time early this year. Yep. yep. So um, he's going to give you an ASAP update. All right. Thank you. So um, as I mentioned earlier, David Flannery, I'm an easement program manager here in, in South Dakota. Started uh, acting when Brandon Cocky moved on to a new role back in November. Uh, rolled into it full time earlier this year, as Val mentioned. So uh, what I'm going to do here is just kind of give a, a general rundown like the other programs did on um, what our um, applications, obligations, everything looked like, um, as well as a proposed update to our WRE screening for FY25, as well as uh, go through the recent announcement for our two batching dates for FY25 ASAP. I believe this handout is in the packet. If not, I can get that to get that out to everyone afterwards. Um, so we'll start with our FY24 WRE. Uh, we had a total of 31 applications, 24 eligible. Um, I, I broke down the acres and uh, you'll note that we actually had more ineligible acres offered than we had eligible this year, but that was skewed by a couple of abnormally large uh, applications we had. Uh, one of those took up over 30% of that number, um, and we had another one that wasn't far behind. So it's not typical that we would have seven applications uh, make up that many acres. So that's just kind of a kind of a side note there. That's that's not common. So out of those 31, we were able to fund. Five, we had one that was a permanent with preserved grazing rights, um, two that were a permanent uh, easement, one that was a 30 year easement with reserve grazing rights, and we also had one existing 30 year WRP that will be converting to a permanent uh, easement. Uh, we have four or five obligated. Our, our fifth obligation package actually just went up to headquarters this morning, so expecting that will probably be done by the end of this week. Um, moving on to ALE, our agricultural land easements. Um, we had a, a really good year for us, which was 11 applications. Um, previous years, we've had one, two, maybe four. It's been pretty slow. Um, for those not familiar with the programs, WRE, it's a U.S. health easement working directly with landowners. Um, ALE is a 
partnership with a third party entity such as South Dakota Land Trust or various other um, um, eligible entities where we work to help provide the funding, minimum deed terms, but then that easement will be held in perpetuity by the eligible third party entity. So those take a little bit more coordination, um, different funding sources, et cetera. So that's why those numbers are a little bit different. So for this year, out of those, we were able to fund two through our IRA funding. Um, that was big for us, uh, over $2.8 million um, for about 6,700 acres. Uh, typically, our, our state farm bill funded allocations in recent years have only been around $600,000. So to be able to uh, fund a significant uh, higher dollar amount through through those funds was, was big. Um, and then for our, our state allocation, we're able to fund two um, for a total of 1,297 acres, uh, and that's about $830,000. We had our first successful uh, request to headquarters for additional funds for ALE, potentially uh, the first ever, but the first in recent years anyway. So that was that was very nice. Um, so that, those are all, you know, not closed at this point. Uh, we're working through obligations. Um, and, and once out here, that'd be a total of over 8,000 acres and over $3.7 million. So that, that's one thing uh, with this Inflation Reduction Act funding that has really given ALE in South Dakota a lot of life. Um, we only have one close in South Dakota at this point in time. And since IRA has begun, we, we've obligated two in FY23. Uh, we're approaching closing on one. The other won't be far behind. But if we're able to get all of these closed, um, we'll go from one to seven all of a sudden in, in a span of two years, roughly, which, I mean, again, it's huge. It's a lot of acres as well um, for, for each uh, individual agreement compared to WRE because we're generally working out west uh, with larger tracts of land. So any questions on that aspect of it as far as what we've been able to fund and, and what those uh, dollar amounts are going to be like? Hey, David, not a question, but just a word of thanks. I mean, it means a lot to your Tony to step up at the beginning of the meeting and say, hey, we're committed to more ALE in the state. Um, it's, it's a testament to you know, what you've got going for us. Um, and it's not just from South Dakota Grand Trust. I mean, I understand it's on behalf of one of the Prairie's Land Trust, the Rago and Foundation, TNC, the, uh, everybody who works with easements in the state. We really appreciate the, the, the renewed commitment to ALE and taking advantage of these funding opportunities. And even beyond them, it's those landowners that are, that are dealing with this issue of, of being in the pathway of development, how important this is making this funding available and helping us get this done. So. Just thanks for, for what the what you're leaning into here and getting going. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you guys as well, because of course we can't do it if we don't have entities on board to help with that. And again, the landowners as well. And and yeah, you know, it, in the past it was never even for a lack of, of wanting, you know, to push for it, but we were just so handicapped by our funding levels and and the you know the applications to show for it. And now in recent years, it seems like everything's really coming together. So I, I'm pretty optimistic about what the future of ALE is already looking like and what it could be even 10 years from now. So looking forward to it and I'm happy that we're able to, to be to this point. So moving on from there, uh, before we get further into um, our FY25 fashion days as we kind of alluded to at the beginning, um, I wanted to run through a proposed update we have for our ASEPWR screening for our farm bill funded. So for, for IRA, that's all nationally funded. Um, in past years, we haven't even had a state allocation for ASEP. New for 25, we will have a state allocation for IRA for ASEP. So that will be a lot different than previous years. Nonetheless, we do not um, have the ability to use screening criteria. We only have a national uh, ranking template that we'll use for that. Um, but getting back to the subject at hand. Um, despite a little bit of an increase in funding, WRE really has changed. We have not had any um, easements funded through, through IRA at all. Uh, we've only been funding through our farm bill state allocations. And 
we're still getting a similar amount of funding each year, but our numbers are very cyclic uh, with the um, basically what our what our weather patterns are looking like. So, you know, we had a few very wet years not too long ago. We had between 100 and 150 applications in any given year. Now we've had a few dry years. Um, you know, people get back to, to farming the, the ground that they maybe uh, they considered putting easements on, and we were down to about that 30 um, application mark. With that, our previous screening that we had uh, really was outdated. It, it, it did not work well for the number of applications we had. Um, we uh, were having to kind of pass on a few applications we were preferred that were a little higher up. So we're, we're simplifying things a bit, or that's that's a proposition anyway. And uh, part of that, we it does require that we do uh, consult with our state technical committee. So I'm considering this our kind of our first uh, first draft of that. So any comments are appreciated. But uh, basically, what we're looking at is a a very high high medium and low, which has been typical to what we've had before. Uh, for a very high priority, we're looking at a permanent duration easement with a two to one to nine to one upland to wetland ratio, which is what our kind of our state ranking caters to. Um, the upland wetland is a, maybe a, a simplified term because that's what we typically see, but that can be adjacent lands at all. So our eligible wetlands to adjacent lands is what we're looking at there or tribal 30 year contracts. That's not something we see very often. Um, we, we would love to work with our tribes on these, you know, as as any applications come in. Um, so we're looking at those being our very high priorities. Our high would be a 30 year duration easement. I meant to put two to one, nine to one in that as well. I, I left it out by mistake on the uh, on the handout. Our medium would be any duration offer with less than that two to one up on the wetland ratio. Um, you know, overall, we're still protecting wetlands, but but a critical component to protecting those is the adjacent lands as well. So um, at times, if we can only protect a concentrated wetland area, that might not mean that we can provide great protection around it. So that's why that goes a little bit further down the list. And then our lows um, would be any duration offer with an existing conservation easement or any duration offer requiring appraisal. Now, appraisals really aren't the end of the world uh, at all. We, we, in fact, have a contract with an appraiser. Uh, he's done a great job for those that have required it. The only problem is um, in South Dakota, we, we go the route for our compensation packages to have an area-wide market analysis and establish our geographic area rate caps through that area-wide market analysis. So we have set rates per county or county cluster, um, and that allows us to, first of all, be very transparent with our uh, landowners who um, are implying we can give them very exact dollar amounts for what their land is going to bring for a value for that easement. Um, but the other thing is when we are in years like this where our funding is a little bit lower, um, our state allocation is in, in about three and a half million dollar range, that can put a big uh, strain on our ability to budget. So, for example, this year we had a, a little bit higher dollar, one that did require an appraisal. And due to volatility in the markets uh, through these past years, um, it, it didn't allow us to go further down the list uh, than we'd like to. We, we could have possibly squeezed in another applicant or two had we known where that appraisal was going to go because it's not a guarantee to get those additional funds. And even if we do, it typically ends up being pretty deep into the fiscal year. So we can run into uh, issues with timelines on that. So um, absolutely nothing wrong with a um, an easement that has a eligible existing conservation easement or requires an appraisal, but that has caused some strain when we get into having multiple when we go through the process and the expense of our area of market analysis and um, getting our compensation package and our guard rates all put together. So for that, does anybody have any questions, uh, comments, concerns with the way that's laid out? That handout wasn't in the app. Matt, it's not. we'll make sure we we'll, okay. follow up here. Sounds good. Yep. Yep. We'll get that all to you. And then uh, if, if any other questions or concerns come up in between time, feel free to reach out.
So with that, uh, on to what I know is in the packet, which was our recent uh, news release uh, that came out from national headquarters. Um, despite mentioning that we will now have a state allocation for ASEP, um, it is still nationally driven. They set two batching dates for us this year. Uh, we haven't had two batching dates for, for easements in probably over a decade, so it's a little bit different for us. Um, so October 4th, we're, <laughs> we're already weeks away from our first batching date uh, for fiscal year 25 for ASAP. Um, that will be IRA only for the first go around. And we've learned recently, as Tony mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we will have flexibility in our IRA allocation on whether that's going to ALE, WRE, combination thereof, we do not have, um, we don't have that split out for us. We get to make those decisions, which is a departure from what we've seen in the past. Um, for the December 20th date, that's what we're anticipating, uh, having our state level um, batching date uh, be incorporated with that. So just to kind of add on to our discussion about the screening. The ranking criteria is slightly different between IRA and Farm Bill, and that's why we do still need to have our, our rankings for that because those scores do end up being slightly different. Um, they just add in at the national level for IRA a few uh, questions about priorities regarding um, different types of soils that they've targeted they want um, in regards to efficiency with carbon sequestration uh, however, with that, the same eligibility criteria applies across the board. It'll just be a slightly different um, ranking. So with that, I believe that is everything I have from, from ASAP. So um, any any last uh, questions, comments, concerns from anybody out there? Tony, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I noticed in there too that your uh, any, any unsuccessful application from last year is automatically included. So correct, you had eleven in and funded four, so there'd be seven already. Seven in minimum. Yep. In addition to whatever else might be submitted by October four. Correct. Yep. Okay. And then again, if any come in, uh, they're still considered uh, for that December twentieth date as well. So that's that's a nice part. You know, if, if something happens to come in last minute or something comes together it took a little longer they still got a second shot come come on uh, december so you said that none of the wra's have been funded with ira funding yet funding. we have not so the, in previous years we have been nationally competitive headquarters makes all selections so so far we've had four ales between 23 and 24 but we've had nothing for wra with this new state allocation now of IRA, do you anticipate some WREs being funded with IRA now? Or yeah, we have not sat down and discussed how we're thinking of um, allocating those funds within our allocation. I only actually found out about that yesterday afternoon, so that was brand new information to me. I haven't even talked to Val about it. Just talked to Tony about it before the meeting started, so that was brand new. I would suspect yes, but we haven't we haven't discussed that yet. All right, anything else? All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple, one more thing that we overlooked in the CSP report. Uh, we updated all of our minimum payments. So a minimum annual payment of $4,000 applies to all of our active conservation stewardship program contracts. So we've gone through, done modifications um, for those. So that was something that was recent. It will impact, it impacted several contracts, um, but all of those efforts have been completed and apply here moving forward. So with that, let we wrap up our programs report. <laughs> it was a long one today. Maybe we won't be invited next round. <laughs> no, that's, that's very important. So this is a lot of information. Thank you all for hanging with us. And, and from the practices section to the program section, if you would like to stand up in the back room or whatever, please feel free to do so. As We just have a couple things left on our agenda. And I think one of these things, this next um, presentation is something that will help tie things together. So uh, feel free to stand up if you need to, but I would invite you to please uh, stay tuned for our next presenter, who is Kent Bleeger, who is our state soil health specialist. So his presentation is how soil health principles and practices fit with conservation easements on working farms. So stick, here you are, Kent. 
Okay, with this, we're making the computer try to work. So one of the things that I will mention while we're getting the computer to work is that um, if you have seen this card on your table or if you saw at the registration desk, it is called the Dakota Conservation Network. And this network is the result of an agreement with the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts. And it's really cool because the uh, Dakota Conservation Network is an opportunity for people to find help, right? And it's a place where partners can also post their help for searching by um, by producers. So this, this uh, Dakota Conservation Network um, ha has been a really great uh, site and it was launched in uh, earlier this year. So part of what we realized is that um, when a producer talks with their local office, the local USDA center or the local conservation district, there may be other partners like our CPPs <laughs> that have um, uh, opportunities. So that's why this, uh, that's the purpose behind the site is that it's a place where people can find help for their water resources or their plants or other other opportunities. So I invite you to check it out. Okay, thank you. And here we're ready to roll. Thanks, Colette. Um, so I have the challenge of tying soil health and soil health principles with easements today. So I've got a pretty good segue with Bruce and David. And so Bruce, I hate to do this to you, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't trust you to give the right answer. <laughs> so why does Ducks Unlimited care about soil health and soil health Water cycle, really. It's a big thing for, for us in a wetland landscape. All right, so improving wetlands so you can have more what? Water column. There you go. All right, so um, and there's a lot of things. Um, some of my coworkers kid me that I try and tie soil health to just about everything. And so um, when I was challenged with trying to tie soil health with easements at first, I was like, hmm, that's a head scratcher, but I think we can get there. So a um, little audience participation. So I'm going to uh, ask for a show of hands, since we have a lot of partners, uh, partner groups, partner agencies, that are both here in person and online today. Um, show of hands for those of you that have worked on easements, either writing them or planning them or holding easements with your agency. How many of you have easements that you are really proud of and you would take your boss's boss to to show off? I see some hands going up. Okay, now let's go to the other side of the equation. How many of you have easements that you would rather not show anyone? Only one. Okay. I worked on easements a little bit in the field office for 17 years. So I have both. So the difference between the two is what? You've got those easements that look amazing. They're great. You would take a tour group to. You would take your boss's boss to. Um, you would take a U.S. representative to to show up. And then you've got those other ones that are really a struggle or a challenge and maybe don't always look the greatest from year to year. No one's willing to speak up. Here's my uh, here's my proposal. I would propose that the only real difference is that some of the planning on the front end before it really went into an easement maybe could have been better on some of those that are now a challenge that are 10, 15, even 30 years out. And so today I'm going to go through um, just maybe some examples or some practices that we could look at on some of our easements. Uh, whether they be grassland easements or wetland easements or predominant easements that we have um, in South Dakota or some of our other newer types that are coming um, coming to head as well. So if you're looking at this picture here online or uh, obviously here in the room, which side of this fence, and don't answer this out loud, just kind of keep your hands in your head, which side of the fence would you, would you rather see? Which side of the fence do you think is an easement and which side is not? Okay, the next sequence of three slides here. Um, I am going to ask for a quick answer from either online or from the group. 
which of these, um, actually, which uh, of these three slides, they all have something in common. And I'm, as I'm going through here, you'll see a lot of difference in the photos, but they all have something in common. So think of what that one commonality might be. So here we have a picture. This is obviously from cropland. And this is from a practice not exactly common, but there are producers using it. This is the interseeding cover crops into standing corn. So we're adding diversity into that crop rotation. Next one here, a little bit more livestock focused. We have livestock grazing in a cover crop into the fall months there. And then we have another fence line photo of a prescribed grazing system. Next one, we have two different uh, pictures of a, of a cropland scenario. And this is one that Bruce uh, gave a good example of or talked about in his presentation. This is uh, two photos of a saline area in different fields. One of them is being um, addressed by a producer intensifying its crop rotation by adding small grains into there. And another one, a producer that they grass off of the mix to try and address those salinity areas. So we've got these three previous, previous slides. Let's skip over this one for time's sake. The three previous slides, what do they all have in common? Any guesses? Other than soil health principles. All of those slides, and even the one I skipped over there at the end, and this one we're showing here, all of those are from different types of easements that we have here in Beetle County. Okay, so the reason I talked about that is these are all what I would call very successful easements. These are ones that you would show off um, for the wildlife groups and for our game fishing parks. And it's in the audience. All those are all open to hunting in some form or another. So either through a walk-in area uh, or a wildlife area. I'd like to show this one, um, seeing that Bruce was preceding me on the, on the agenda. So this is from an area that um, our Ducks Unlimited um staff would know well and some of those that have been to tours here in the area uh or through some of our trainings as nrcs employees uh this is a crop field that happens to be in an easement as well um this is a soil health plot that is used for demonstration purposes um that is that happens to have an easement on it and what we're showing here is you can see a spade standing in some um small grain and then you see Right next to that spade is a duck nest that's in there. So the reason I tie soil health practices and soil health principles into easements is because I think it can really address all of our needs that are on our easements. So our easements are placed in for wetland purposes or other things. Um, so U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services is here, marks in the back. So a lot of their easements are grassland or wetland easements or both. And you've got some counties, uh, for example, Sanborn County to the south of us here in Beetle has a lot of easements on it, a lot of grassland easements. And some of those, working with producers um, through my NRCS work in field offices, some of those easements look amazing. And some of those grassland easements, yes, it's still in grassland, but it looks kind of like a tabletop. So there's some soil health, man soil health principles that should be adopted on those areas if we really want to maximize the potential and use of those easements. So these are those five principles of soil health, keep the soil covered, minimize soil disturbance, um, increase plant diversity when possible, have a live continual, uh, continual living root in the soil as long as possible throughout the season, and integrate livestock. How can we do this on easements? This is a photo from not too far away from where we're sitting today. It's a fence line photo. So it's kind of a landscape uh, scale that you're seeing here. And we're gonna move closer up. So this land is under easement as well. Okay, take a snapshot in your mind's eye of this photo and look at the next one because it's from the same location. What's the difference between those two? This is the same year. This is from last year. Same fence line, almost same exact location. So what am I trying to show there? Management, right. So there's a difference in management. The very first slide that I showed you that I asked which side of the fence is the easement and which is not, kind of a trick question. Both of those, both sides of the fence were an easement. You can't have 
this side of the fence, which I think we would all agree looks amazing. It's all native vegetation, really well developed and grown. You can't have this side without the livestock on this side year after year. I think many of us have seen those set aside acres that were put in Eastern a long time ago, um, especially for wildlife management areas when they were left to sit idle. No management took place out there. And then eventually 10, 15, 20 years down the road, it turns into brown grass. And I agree that's not meeting our easement needs. Okay, we also have easements that are on cropland as well. We have wetland easements, quite a few that are on cropland. And this is the practice here. This is the interceding. I'm just sticking with the same thing to uh, save time. It's a sequence over the course of the year. Okay, that's important to have these practices in there. It helps to provide better water quality for those potholes that take place that are all over South Dakota, as Bruce talked about in his presentation. It helps to improve soil health, obviously. It helps the producer to manage some of those saline acres that might take place. It's going to meet many needs. It also meets that producer's uh, uh, pocketbook needs. Keeps these areas productive and improves soil. It allows them to get harvest a crop off there and integrate livestock at the end after harvest. Um, this is an example of what previous year's management look, can look like in the following spring. And so this is a good fence line photo, one of my favorites. Um, you can see on the right hand side, you have open water. On the left hand side, it's pretty much inundated by cattails. The only difference there is that this side was left idle the previous year, this side was grazed. And you can see what the livestock did. They opened up the water, um, thinned out the cattail stand, and made a better area and open, open water access for waterfowl. This is one that is uh, I've used in uh, lots of presentations. You can see pretty obvious line that takes place. There's the management difference again. This is also an easement, um, a, new, a newer easement. It's a grassland easement. Also happens to be um, expiring CRP soon. Right hand side of the photo, you can see a big blue stem in Indian grass. Nice tall stand there. The previous year was done under a uh, managed grazing plan for, for drought purposes. And there was a hot wire put up right down the middle, left side was not grazed or hay, nothing was done with it, and it's a pretty good stand of smooth brome grass there. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to reiterate, what I'm trying to get across is that soil health principles apply to our easements as well. Um, if we can make those soil health principles work for the easement and for the producer, I think we're gonna have these really long-term successful easements that are gonna look good for those 30-year easements and into the into perpetuity as well, those perpetual easements. So with that, hopefully I've tied some soil health principles and easements. Any comments or questions for me? All right, thank you. Here, Clint. Thanks, Ken. It's always interesting to see the practices in place and how they're impact, improving the environment. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we have got just a couple things left on our agenda. Um, under on the agenda, the last part of it is partnerships and, and USD and NRCS South Dakota agreements update. So um, my department, the uh, Partnerships External Affairs Division, uh, oversees uh, relations with partners for grants and agreements. Um, one of the things we did this past year is we were able to um, we were able to have a conservation collaboration cooperative agreement uh, announcement last winter. And those proposals were, we had 13 proposals come in in May, and with that, we were able to select just two proposals uh, for um, which will hopefully be making their way through grants and agreements yet this before September 30th. So that'll be uh, moving along. Um, one of the things that uh, I would also like to um, bring to attention is that in partnerships division, it, it's been really fun because uh, one of the chief's priorities of our agency is for equity in program delivery and outreach. So I was pleased to have on my staff um, the state tribal liaison as well as our um, state outreach coordinator. And so with them and their efforts, they've been able to do some additional activities. So I'd like to introduce Daryl Nadal. Um, and he wanted to just speak a little bit about some of the outreach activities that we've been doing across the state to help ensure equity in our program delivery. Thank you, Colette. 
And I'll start with our, our tribal nations. And I know that Tony may want to say, but Tony and our state tribal liaison, Nate Grieve, have been visiting with them. We'll continue to visit with them on a one on one government to government relationship basis. And I want to remind those online, especially if Tina's still online with Cisno Optimization, that Jessica mentioned trainings available for our partners. That does include tribal employees and BIA employees, that it could be simply a workshop for the afternoon or come to our employee several day training also. We, we keep that invitation open for our, the tribal government employees and also possible federal employees with BIA. With that, especially with time constraint, we one of our focus areas of our South Dakota outreach plan does focus towards beginning farmer ranchers. Uh, that does not have to be new customers to NRCS, but overall, we focus on new customers, whether that's just technical assistance, can't talk in on soil health practices for persons that are new to NRCS and our USDA services, or it could be beginning farmers also. And last fall in NRCS in South Dakota, we did a focused direct mailing effort. We partnered with Farm Service Agency and, and did a mailing of approximately 3,000 persons or entities that's already in FSA's database, and then followed up with field office follow-up assistance for that local contact for beginning farm and ranchers. That did result in approximate in a larger than normal set of applications for Bell's programs of our standard of our um, flagship program, environmental quality incentive program, and conservation stewardship program. And what I would like you to do is turn in your packet to page five, towards the back of page five. I think that's the opposite the CSP page, and you have a blank page. I'm going to make you make your own hand up. So you got your blank page, and I have you write down a couple numbers. Need to write down 15.7. Towards the upper left hand corner. I'm going to make you do this 15.7. Then below that, write 19. Below that number, write 150,000. And then seven, 171 is the last of those numbers. So, what those numbers are is the result the end of those two programs of our number of, that results in beginning farmer direct assistance to beginning farmer ranchers. Some of the program information that Val and her team presented listed fund codes that was titled beginning farmer rancher. Those are some fund codes, but not necessarily the total obligations that went to recipients that fall into the category that generally our current farm bill defines as less than 10 years. The first number you wrote down 15.7, that's $15.7 million obligated to beginning farmer ranchers, individuals or entities in South Dakota alone so far this year in FY24. $15.7 million obligated in long-term agreements at CSP or EQIP that goes to benefit their operations, civil health, and local economies. You wrote down a number underneath that of 19%. That is the percent of the total obligations. So 19% of our total obligations of, of that of that 70 some million dollars is what that 15.7 equates to. 19% of our obligation towards beginning farmer ranchers. 150,000 acres that we're helping service with those 171 contracts. 171 contracts with beginning farmer ranchers, individuals, or entities, 150,000 acres that we're assisting just with obligations that we started this year. So kudos to field offices that worked on those, who generally may take a little more work than others, and kudos to the program staff that Bell runs to help administer and keep those, that focus towards assisting that population. With that, this fall, we are focusing on a direct mail campaign to operators, producers, growers within reservation boundaries. That's our next step in one of our focus areas. Tony, is there anything you want to add at that point? Thank you. What? Okay, great. 
All right, we are coming fast to the close. I think there were a couple of partners that may have wanted to um, have that may have had announcements. I guess at this point, I would just quickly open up the floor real quick to see if you had um, wanted to make some announcements. And if so, please uh, raise your hand or stand and we'll get you the microphone. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I guess we're into past morning. Um, again, Tony Life at South Dakota Grand Cross House. I serve on the steering committee for uh, the South Dakota Grassland Initiative. Just wanted to point out that the initiative will have our we will have our quarterly meetings here coming up the first three days of October. There's a flyer on the table over here uh, to grab one to, to see where where you could uh, attend one of those. Red City October first here on October second. Watertown on October 3rd. Um, and again, just wanted to let you know if there's a flyer up here if you want to grab one. Uh, make plans to, to join those that uh, quarterly update meeting if you can make it. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Do we Thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to give a little update on what South Central RCND has been doing. Um, we were very pleased to be able to have a conservation collaborative cooperative agreement with through NRCS for education and outreach on woody encroachment in the South Central area, which is Todd Millette, Tripp, and Jones County. Um, this summer, because the annual producers are very busy, um, we just went out and attended um, events out into the community. We set up our uh, booth. Um, at 16 different events across the four counties, and we had outreach to over 140 people. Um, we also did some, what I call little blurbs on uh, KWI, our radio station, um, on Friday and Saturday mornings. And um, I asked the radio station if they could kind of give me an estimate as to how far our little announcements went. And he said, according to their ratings that they have, their station reaches 15,000 people every 15 minutes. So our little 30-second ad, I figured, reached about 500 people. So I was very pleased with that. Um, um, one thing that is not under our cooperative agreement, but South Central likes to go out and work in different areas um, in our with different partners. Um, we worked with SDSU, the NRCS staff on White River, and um, the Rosebud Tribal Ranch. Um, the Tribal Ranch has been hosting, this is their seventh year, of uh, youth and adult rangeland um, workshop. And so South Central has always helped them with the youth end of it by donating um, uh, backpacks towards it, but this year we were able to go down and actually help with the workshop. Um, it was a very big success. Um, they said this is the biggest turnout they've ever had. They had 32 adults and 42 youth who came in to um, learn about uh, pasture or uh, plant ID, and in the morning um, we had um, we had um, Kaylee Weller. She's with SDSU Extension out of here. She's a rangeland specialist. She came in and showed the adults how to clip the grass, um, throw a hoop out there and clip it, weigh it, and figure out um, tonnage. She had grazing sticks there. She showed everybody how to use them. Um, it was, and then we went out and did some uh, plant D with the adults. Um, we had two local experts, Foster Cahoyer and Carmelita Shoulders, who um, once the plant was ad identified, they told all the attendees what that plant was, name was in the Lakota language, and how those native plants were used, um, either through for medicine or for food. Um, Nathan Jones was down. He brought down the rainfall simulator. That was uh, very well received. Uh, then in, uh, the youth came 
and um, the tribal ranch fed everybody. And then the youth, we took them out and we did also some plant ID uh, with them also. Um, the people who ran our groups for the plant ID was Mary Scott, Kaylee Weller, Ron Frederick, and Mike Schmidt help with that. So um, they were very pleased with um, the turnout and um, so we're planning again for next year. Um, and this was all done on the Rosebud, the tribal ranch for the, for the tribe. Um, this in first of August, um, Jennifer Schoen was uh, hired to help South Central with their uh, marketing and and also to help organize their workshops. Um, a couple things coming up. South Central is having their annual meeting on September 25th in Murdo at the Senior Center. Um, we invite people to come if they would like. We would like to have an RSVP for the meal. But we're going to have Clint Rasmussen, who is a local producer that has been using goats to control woody encroachment, and he's going to put on a presentation that evening. Um, November 6th, we have already set up a, what we're going to call a road tour. Um, we have a couple speakers coming in. We're going to start White River at the Sweet Spot, and then we are going to go and travel around to three producers in the area, um, and they're going to go over the control that they've used. One of them is use some chemical control through an NRCS program. Um, he's going to kind of let everybody know how how that has turned out for him on the larger trees that you can't get to versus smaller ones that um, are easier to um, to get to in his pastures. Um, we have another gentleman that is hoping to get a prescribed burn in next month. And uh, if and we're going to stop and hit that spot regardless whether he gets it burned or not, but just so he can explain what his, his plan is. And then the, the last stop is going to be at a, a producer that has just been doing total mechanical control. Uh, when I call this gentleman to visit with him, he is not somebody that you will see out in the public, attend workshops. He's pretty reserved. Um, was a little nervous about calling him, but he said, I certainly will talk to anybody. And um, he said, but I'm not a public speaker. Um, and I said, well, that's that's fine. You'll just be standing out in your area, so you'll be, you know, in your comfortable surroundings. And he said, the only thing I will have to say is, if you think you have 40 trees, you will have 400 out there. So um, I'm sure he'll say a few more words than that for us. But that was his take on the the need for the control of the eastern red cedar in his area. So um, the last thing is, is we are. Uh, South Central is working with their partners to try and get the 47th Annual Ranchers Workshop organized. Uh, we'll be having a few committee meetings here coming up shortly. So the middle of January, we don't have a date set, but that's where we're looking at having it in White River. And there'll be more posters coming out on those two events on November 6th and then also in January. Um, I do have some... Uh, South Central's annual report, if anybody would like to take one. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Any, any questions for Joel? Is there anyone online that has a, um, yes, I see a hand up on there. Um, we'll turn it to you. Okay. Matt, is that you? Yep, that's me. Um, I will be quick. I know everybody's anxious to get going. So um, as Tony did, I also want to give a big shout out to my field staff, our Farm Bill Biologist team. Uh, they're kind of the face of the CRP program here in the state. So um, really looking forward to seeing uh, not only the quality, but also the quantity and the amount of acres that they impact here. So once we get through um, the next uh, couple weeks here, um, they're finishing things this week, but Looking forward to seeing those total acreage reports from them and everything they're getting done. So again, big shout out to them. 
um, continuous. They were wrapping up last week in Grassland CRP, getting stuff to the finish line here this week on their end of things. So just a few other things here with Pheasants Forever in the state going on. Uh, I did submit a RCPP uh, going after primarily financial assistance for landowners, implementing prescribed fire and brush management and prescribed grazing and associated practices. So um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna be watching the email very close when it comes time to uh, mid to late October. So really looking forward, uh, hopefully we have some luck with that. Um, and then um, I'll kind of summarize things real quick. Um, biggest thing is uh, staffing coming up for us. So. Uh, uh, we'll have a few positions coming out here that we will be uh, hiring for. So the first one that'll be um, coming out will be for our monarch, monarch and native pollinator coordinating wildlife biologist here in the state. So some of you may have heard uh, Kat Bell um, has been promoted to a national position within Pheasants Forever. So at the end of the month, she, she will be transitioning to that. Um, so if you know anybody interested, send them my way. Um, Looking forward to getting that position continuing, been highly successful and look forward to continuing that. So um, beyond that, um, we'll be having the, uh, the positions posted for our precision ag and conservation specialists uh, hitting, um, hitting the airwaves here very soon too. Just wrapping up the sub award uh, agreement with SCSU with that. Uh, making sure every acre counts RCPP. So uh, it's taking a little longer than we anticipated, but that should be out soon. And then, uh, yeah, later this fall, um, there'll be some other other positions coming too. So I'll uh, I'll bite my time my tongue on that for the time being. But uh, that was the biggest thing. And then again, wanted to recognize our Farm Bill biologist team, as well as the South Dakota Game Fish and Parks, their private lands biologist and conservation officer teams, uh, really helped uh, roll out our public access to habitat program. So we kicked that off September 1st of 2023. And in the first year, we enrolled over 16,000 acres into that program. So that ties into uh, supplemental payments with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks walk-in area program program, uh, which I think many of you in the room know that they work through Farm Bill funding with that with the Voluntary Public Access Habitat Incentive Program. So uh, that program is set up to help state and federal governments encourage landowners to allow public access for hunting, fishing, and other wildlife uh, recreational opportunities throughout the state. So um, I got lots more I could talk on, but I know time is of the essence, so I'll cut it shut cut it short there and if anybody has any questions i'd be happy to answer them otherwise thanks for your time thank you Matt. any questions for another great partner at work lots of those in this room and online anyone else online for reports if so or raise your hand or, or turn the camera on and uh, I guess this will be bringing our meeting to a close. Um, I just want to remind everyone, if you do have some topics or subjects that you would like to be addressed at our, our next meeting for uh, next quarter, please get that information to Tony, to me, or to Randy, and we'll be sure to um, look at how we can best address that topic. And uh, Tony, would you have any closing comments for today? So again, like I started off this morning, thank you for making the effort to come here. Thank you for making the effort to be a part of this meeting. And as we move forward and we continue to develop these opportunities for, for the partnership to come together and meet and talk about our, our different opportunities across the state, I'd love to know what your, what your topics are. What are some things that we need to focus on? What are some things that the that NRCS needs to drive towards for South Dakota? We have a lot of conservationists across the state within the agency, but the voice of, of the partnership is so important for us. So please, please take take the advantage of, of letting us know what our topic should be for our next for our next meeting or for future meetings. This really is about hearing from all of you and making sure that the agency is being responsive. We really strive for that locally led approach, and this again is a part of that. So please let me know. Let Colette know what these topics are as we move forward so we can be addressing them and making sure that we're being responsive to the needs of South Dakota. So again, thank you all. I'm going to hang out for a little bit. So if anybody wants to visit with me before you head back out, um, I'm going to be here.
But again, just thank you all for taking the time to be here and online. So thank you all and thank you for this partnership. Thank you very much. With that, we'll close the meeting and have a great trip uh, home with everyone. And, and we'll see you at the next meeting, which will likely be December 17th. So we'll, we'll send out a save the date. Have a great day, everyone. Yes. 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 Yes.